I'd like to welcome everyone to the Ronald Reagan Library and to our event this evening. And uh, we are very, very pleased, as uh, I am Beatrice Restifo, the president of the Thousand Oaks Republican Women, and we are partnering with uh, the um, Walter and Leonore Annenberg Presidential Learning Center and um, Director Penay here, who will be speaking in a moment. And I would like to uh, start the program in honor of our military and law enforcement and fire department, fire people that protect us uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. If you would all rise, I'll call on Rosemary Licata to give the pledge. <clears throat> the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, visible with liberty and justice for all. I would just like to say that after the program, there is a constitution uh, available for everyone here, if you would care to take one and read it uh, periodically. And now, <laughs> I would like to thank on, um, uh, Anthony Penet for allowing us to be here. We are very honored to be part of this. And we're also double thank and double honor to have Dr. Gordon Lloyd here again for the second time. Thank you very much. Now I'll call on Anthony Penet, the director of the Walter and Leonore Annenberg Presidential Learning Center. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this rather chilly fall. Usually it's not chilly. It hasn't been chilly for quite some time here in California. So, uh, My name is Tony Penny, and I'm the Chief Learning Officer here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. And I have the tremendous fortune to work with the single finest education team at any museum in the country, a team that strives each and every day to fulfill its mission to cultivate the next generation of citizen leaders. In President Reagan's farewell address to the nation, he spoke of the need for an informed patriotism. Are we doing a good enough job of teaching our children what America is and what she represents in the long history of the world? Well, thanks to partnerships and friendships like the one we have with our speaker tonight, I believe that we are doing at least our part. Uh, I also want to thank our partners, uh, Beatrice and Rosemary. Thank you so much. Uh, if you uh, enjoyed the food, please thank Rosemary and Beatrice. Uh, it was delicious. It was wonderful. And food and drink, as we may learn a little bit about tonight uh, during Dr. Lloyd's talk, was very instrumental in the uh, formation of the Constitution. <laughs> Um, I also want to thank all of you for coming out, for investing a Wednesday night. I'm not going to say giving up. You're not giving up anything. You're getting something tonight. So thank you for investing a Wednesday night uh, to learn a little bit more about the Constitution and for being the sorts of informed patriots that President Reagan knew we needed. Before introducing our speaker, I want to provide just a little bit of context by drawing on the words of two presidents who perhaps more so than any other presidents in the past hundred years have shaped the relationship between our country and its Constitution. So first I want to start with the 150th anniversary. So for all our students out there, who knows who was the president during the 150th anniversary of the Constitution? I'll give you a hint, polio, wheelchair, FDR, there we go. Uh, so during the 150th anniversary of the Constitution, Franklin Roosevelt said this, in commemorating this period, we shall affirm our debt to those who ordained and established the Constitution. We shall recognize that the Constitution is an enduring instrument fit for the governing of a far-flung population of more than 130 million, we've grown a little bit since then, engaged in diverse and varied pursuits, even as it was a fit for the governing of a small agrarian nation of less than four million. It is therefore appropriate that in the period herein set apart, we shall think afresh of the founding of our government under the Constitution, how it has served us in the past, and how in the days to come its principles will guide the nation ever forward. So speaking of forward, we're gonna fast forward 50 years to the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. Does anybody know who was the president during the 200th anniversary of the Constitution? 
I'll give you a hint. His name is all over the place around here. <laughs> Ronald Reagan, yes. So Ronald Reagan, on the 200th anniversary of the Constitution, said, to look back on that time at the difficulties faced and surmounted can only give us perspective on the present. Each generation, every age, I imagine, is prone to think itself beset by unusual and particularly threatening difficulties. To look back on the past as a golden age when issues were not so complex and politics not so divisive, does it sound familiar in this uh, election season? Uh, when problems did not seem so intractable. Sometimes we're tempted to think of the birth of our country as one such golden age, a time characterized primarily by harmony and cooperation. But it wasn't the absence of problems that won the day in 1787. It wasn't the absence of division and difficulty. It was the presence of something higher, the vision of democratic government founded upon those self-evident truths that still resounded in Independence Hall. It was that ideal proclaimed so proudly in this hall a decade earlier that enabled them to rise above politics and self-interest, to transcend their differences and together create this document this constitution that would profoundly and forever alter not just these United States, but the world. So now we're gonna fast forward another 29 years, and tonight in honor of the 229th anniversary of the Constitution, which will be this Saturday, the 17th, we are pleased to have not a president, but a doctor, Gordon Lloyd, continue his annual Constitution Day lecture. Gordon's been coming out for I think four or five years now at this point, and I enjoy it every year. Uh, it's become one of my favorite events here at the library. Dr. Lloyd is the co-author of three books on the American founding and the sole author of a book on the political economy of the New Deal, and has a number of articles, reviews, opinion editorials to his credit, uh, including a new article that you just sent me on the National Constitution Center website. Um, his latest co-authored book, or at least late as of 2013, was The New Deal in Modern American Conservatism, A Defining Rivalry, which I highly recommend. Uh, and he also recently released as an editor Debates in the Federal Convention of 1787. This one will take you a little longer, but just as worth reading. Uh, he's the creator with the help of the Ashbrook Center of four, four highly regarded websites, which we'll learn a little bit about tonight, on the origin of the Constitution, and has received a number of teaching scholarly and leadership awards. Uh, and my personal favorite credit of his is that he serves on the National Advisory Council for the Walter and Lenore Annenberg Presidential Learning Center right here at the foundation and has been instrumental in helping us create some of our programs here. So joining us to discuss the importance of the city of Philadelphia itself, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gordon Lloyd. Thank you, Tony. Am I on? Right. Uh, <clears throat> in Plato's Republic, In Plato's Republic, the first lines are, I went down to the Piraeus, where he thought he and Glaucon, Socrates and Glaucon would see the festival and see what was happening in the air and what was going on. But in America, we don't go down to the Piraeus. Uh, last week, at least I don't. Last weekend, I went down to Parade Magazine which is the American equivalent. And when you, it is, it's Madison's Republic rather than Plato's Republic. And in the parade magazine of last Saturday or Sunday all across this nation was a commentary on if you were president, what would you do about Constitution Day? And I found it fascinating to hear what we might call ordinary people and celebrities, that is Americans, say, not scholars, there was not one scholar uh, uh, surveyed, thank goodness. It was ordinary Americans and they were asked, well, if you were president, what would you do about Constitution Day? And I thought the best one of all came from um, uh, the following. Karim Abdul Jabbar. And he says, if I were president, I would make Constitution Day a national celebrated holiday with public readings from the Constitution, a Supreme Court versus Congress basketball game, <laughs> and other events that promoted learning about the greatest political document ever written. 
we need better public understanding of the document than is supposed to guide the moral and social choices of our government and our people. I would love to hear more from Mr. Jabbar about that because I think he has had an extremely important part to play in Constitution Day and the reverence for uh, September, the 7th, uh, September the 17th. The, one of the problems with that question is why would you want the president to declare that? What's one wrong with the Congress declaring that? Why do we want a president? So I think that part of this presidential election that we're in right now is for us to reconsider what is the importance of the presidency. Uh, and, and, and for one of the first times in my life, I've, I've now, I now read there's something called a down ballot or something down the, down the series that's not presidential, as if the presidency is the only act in town. I've also heard that something called midterms, an off year. What's off about the year? So I don't think that the question should be what should the president do about Constitution Day, but what should we do about Constitution Day, and what should we do through the Congress about Constitution Day? What is this fascination or somehow attachment simply to the president? And I would hope that this election might uh, encourage people of both parties within the Congress to rethink the status of Congress within the three branches. Right now, Congress is the, in the lo, in, held in the lowest esteem of all the branches. It should be held in the highest esteem. And if somebody were to ask me, is there a difficulty with the Democratic Republic in which we're in? The answer is yes. And what is that difficulty? Congress is not held in high esteem. And until we return that, then we will not have separation of powers. We will not have the kind of democratic republic that it seems to me that we ought to be honoring today. So with that brief introduction, um, I now put everything to one side and wing it. <clears throat> there are a number of websites. You're paying attention to me, aren't you? I can tell. Good. All right. No, no I'm, just, I'm just checking. I'm just checking. Because I, I, I thought you were about to fall asleep when I'm talking about National Basketball Association. And I said, what is he doing here? Right? No, he's just talking. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. right. So there are, there are a number of websites that I've put together. Good to see you again, madam. It, uh, a number of websites which try to encourage people through text, a textual approach, a visual approach, uh, a biographical approach to try to understand the framers and what the Constitution means. Not what the Supreme Court has said it means, not what other people have said it means, but how did, how did the Constitution get to be what it was? That's been my, my, my life for the last 25 to 30 years, and hopefully for the next one. What are you laughing at? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So now, what, what, if, if, it, um, if we were to go and look at the four possibilities that exist on the website, there are four of them. Expl if you hit Explore the American Founding. Now, now Tony is not only the uh, El Jefe Supremo, he is now my, um, mm -hmm, yes, quite, quite. I won't use the word. <laughs> so there are is the Constitutional Convention, that's one of them. If you click on Constitutional Convention, you will see, and if we go down, to, uh, right, you will see that there is an introduction, which we can ignore. There's a convention, which is a four-act drama, and that, I think, helps you to understand the, um, the debates that go on, because the debates cover all those pages which now Tony has taken away. But it's about a, a 700 pages. How, how do you make sure that you don't get lost? So one way is creating a four-act drama. Act one, the presentation of the, of the plans. Act 
two, the resolution. Act three, setting down the, setting, setting, setting the details. Act four, thank goodness we're going home. So, it's, so in order to keep you interested in the material, am I smiling enough? Shall I pose? Shall I, shall, I, shall, I, shall, I, shall I get some spray on my hair? This is Hollywood. How about this side? No, no, are we done? Can you put that thing away? <laughs> you see, she, 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 she's upset that I was paying all the attention. Now I'm paying attention to you. It's for you? It's for publication. Oh, my. You didn't ask my permission. <laughs> All right. So part of it is a day-by-day -day summary of the convention. The Constitution Convention is a four-act drama. That goes through the entire material of the convention. I'm not going to do that tonight. But it's there in the event that you want to try to go through the actual original text. In addition, there are the delegates. We can, look at, we can look at the delegates. Who are they? What are their backgrounds? What are their economic interests? Continental experience. So some people like the textual approach. Other people like the biographical approach. So I'm not here to try to introduce the framers as, as one way. I'm trying to get you attached to the framers and the framers attached to you. Some of you are more visual. Some of you are more biographical. Okay. So this is the way to get to it. Resources of the convention. Here, if we hit this section, you can see uh, there's a whole bunch of things, like who was on, if you really want to be a, uh, some kind of a public policy wonk, you want to know which committee each person was on, and what are they doing, and how did they get elected, it's there. But I mean, if you want to know selected correspondence, what did they write home to their wives and their, and their children, and etc., it's all there. But why would you be interested in that? unless you are totally mad about the founding, like I am. Um, I put that together, convention attendance record. If we just click on that for a moment, Tony. This is a day-by-day -day account of who is there and what they're doing. And you can put it in Microsoft Excel. We just, if you click on that for a moment, and hopefully the Reagan Library is working fast. Oh, look at that. So that I can tell you, Robert Morris, when he was he there? What well, about John Blair? When was he there? And you can track, you can track everything with regard to it. So, so now we're really getting deep. So it's time to get not so deep. But that's how deep you can go. Okay, let's go back. Uh, let's go back exactly one more time. And, and we've got the signing of the Constitution. Interactive scene at the signing of the Constitution. Let's go there for a moment. So here we have perhaps what I think is the most famous painting. You don't see it often because it's hanging in, it's hanging in the Capitol building and no one goes there for, for good reason. But it is the best because it represents in a, in a very important way what the American Constitution is about. It is the result, it is the product, it is the outcome of a deliberation process. So you've got 39 people represented in this room. I happen to deal with a lot of teachers and a lot of students, and one of the upsetting qualities, which a number of teachers have come to me about, and I'm sure I'm gonna see this because tomorrow morning, dark and early, I get on the plane, and go and give a Constitutional Day lecture at Skidmore College, and I know what's going to happen. It's not going to be as receptive and as open as what I'm having here. It's not going to be. I know, they're going to have all these arguments. They're going to say, what's wrong with that painting? And what's wrong with that painting, they're going to say, because I've heard it, is that they're all white men who are rich, and there are no transgender, and there's no well, I'm not going to, there's one, but I'm not going to out him tonight. <laughs> but, but, but what is good about this painting, if we were to ask what's good about this painting, is for the first time in the history of the world, you have at least 39 white men 
sitting down and, and discussing for 88 days the nature of the Constitution and not a drop of blood was spilled. So that's the start. What framers do is to frame. What founders do is to found. They're not supposed to be the closers or the enders. That is what we're about. We're supposed to be the next generation that carries that through and that understands what is our responsibility to get to the next generation. To, to say that our founders are, look. All right, so here's Hamill, all right? I, what I like about this, if, I don't know if this works, if you click it on, if you click on Hamilton, please don't, yeah, right, so what I like about it, you don't even have to know that's Hamilton, right, so you figure it out. There's Hamilton, you want to know more about him. So Hamilton is talking to, Je to, to, to Franklin. So you think, well, why is this Howard Christie presenting these two, these are two superdelegates, right? Actually, they're the only two non-presidents who have been on our coins and money. Damn, you say. No, I said $10 bill. Oh, right, 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 right. right. But, 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 you know, and if, it weren't, and it, if it weren't for the show, he'd be off it. $10. So I'm wondering, what would Hamilton, who's only been there half the time, be telling Franklin, who was there all the time, but he was out of it, what could he possibly be telling him? And I came up with a number of things, which my dear wife, Angela, said, <clears throat> you shouldn't be talking about <laughs> And I have obeyed her ever since. But Alexander Hamilton is an immigrant. And he's an immigrant from the West Indies. I am an immigrant from the West Indies. Do you believe me? No, I'm just asking you a question. Do you believe me? It's either yes or no or maybe. Maybe, what do, I have to, what do I have to do to show you that I'm an immigrant from the Caribbean? I'm, suppo I'm supposed to carry that on me all the time? But what if I talk like one? All right, so, so, Hamilton, so Hamilton turns to Franklin and says, Hey, Benny, man, the whole bunch of people outside there waiting for us to talk. What you could tell them? And Franklin says, please don't call me Benny. My name is Dr. Franklin. So, okay, okay, doc. Let me talk. Outside, people are going to ask you what we create, what we sign in. And Franklin says, a republic, if we can keep it. And Franklin says, so Mr. Hamilton, what would you say? And he says, a monarchy if I could get it. That didn't bring a laugh, you know. It, 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 it should have, all right, but it didn't. All right, so they have these two superdelegates. Rosemary, really? <laughs> I mean, really? What are you doing to me? Right in the middle of it. I would tell the young to turn it off, right? Bob, what, what is going on? What do you think is going on? Rosemary's in a lot of trouble. Wouldn't you think? She owes me one, you think? Yes. Big time, right in the middle. All right, so we can go back. So we could, we could play around with this photograph, but we're not going to. That is what I'm going to be doing at Friday night at Skidmore to go through this photograph and to show what is important about it, not what is bad about it, what is, you know, et cetera, et cetera. What we're going to do tonight, after all this long intro, did you shut that off? Good. I'm glad you paid for dinner. <laughs> what we want to do is the interactive map of historic Philadelphia. Right? There are many ways that we can try to understand the framing. And, and look, one, and again, I said it's the textual, another one is biographical, another one is visual. What we're going to do tonight is to say, what if you were there? 
And that is a big part of education. Go, you, know, you go to Jerusalem, or you go to uh, Athens, or you go to East Berlin, whatever, whatever, and you try to imagine. So the imagination is being challenged as to, but you know full well, it's not like that anymore. But at least it challenges you. So what I want to do, if I have the time, and with um, Tony's patience, is to touch a number of these spots on this map. This is a replication of historic Philadelphia. In the sense, historic in the sense, something important took place there. In every story, you have to have a beginning, and, and stories have a, an end and a middle. And it is true that, well, it, it, as people say, well, you know, everything unfolds. And there's, you know, how, well, well, how far back do you go? And how far back do you take it? I mean, how, do you blame your, your, not just your parents, but your grandparents and your great-grandparents for who you are? Or where do you stop? Where do you start the story? A certain time is, you know, the sun rises, the sun sets. In a certain sense, we are born and we die. So where do we begin and where do we end? Is there a historic Philadelphia? Yes. And it's 1776, 1787, 1790 to 1800. 25 years of incredible, um, it's, to me, it, it, it parallels anything in the previous 20 centuries of the world for 25 years. And this was it, 40,000 people living between, essentially, Spruce Street on the south and uh, 9th Street on the west. You could even probably move it to 7th Street and to Front Street. By the way, this, this whole area now goes into a freeway. It's, it's absolutely, really, and never mind. Um, and then on the north, you go to Arch and uh, Arch, Arch Street on the north. So there were 40,000 people living in Philadelphia at that time. So, it is, so that act, there was actually a place, Philadelphia. It was the second largest place in the British Commonwealth. It was probably equal to London in terms of intellectual uh, character. It was the political center of the world, and it introduced Something that we don't realize, again, religious liberty and right of conscience. And I, one of the things that if you ever take, if you who are young who are going to take away from what I'm talking tonight is framers and founders lay foundations. They do not complete. That's our task, right? So that you, if you look back and you say, well, they didn't do that. Well, what did they do? They laid the foundation so that you could do that later on. Okay, so I'm a defender of the framers. I am not a person who holds the framers as being irresponsible. I do not think America is ill-founded. It is the best founded, the more perfect, not a perfect union like, like Plato's Republic, but it is a more perfect union and the first time it has ever happened in the world and not a drop of blood was spilt. You don't, I mean, the image of America is this to me and the Christie painting. It is not, all due respects, a bare-breasted Amazon woman having a gun in one hand and a, a tricolor flag in the other, stepping on dead bodies, saying this is the French Revolution. That's blood. This is discussion. You're going to be, so there's going to be compromise. So you're not going to have perfection. But you might all be still alive. So what I thought we would do is briefly go through some of the um, places on this spot. And then you can ask me where you might like to go on some of these places. Uh, for example, let's just take the Indian Queen Tavern. And so what you do is you just go to the Indian Queen Tavern. Uh, now that's a, that's a portrait of the Indian Queen Tavern in 1787. So that's what it looked like. 
Uh, so Mrs. Mary, this is Mary House, owned this Indian Queen Tavern. It was built in 1759. It was home to five of the delegates. Uh, Gorham, Strong, Mason, Pierce. So this tavern was not just a place to drink. It was a place to meet and a place to sleep and a place to convene. And according to folklore, many important negotiations took place after the daily sessions, which lasted for six hours a day. So they had to go somewhere after, and they kept chatting, because they really was, they were really policy wonks. So they were really involved in it. And they hammered out a whole bunch of things. So this is the Indian Queen Tavern. Very important. What does it look like today? If we scroll down, it is a Fox News Channel station. Well, it may be um, appropriate. But it's an example of what, what, here's the thing. What do we remember? What do we forget? How do we remember? How do we forget? We all have, we're all guilty of clutter. We're all guilty of throwing away things that we wish that we hadn't. When my father died, I brought over the ocean from Britain I brought over 250 jazz tapes that, that he had made with the intent that I was going to turn them into CDs and listen to them. And my son, quite correctly, told me, why are you doing that, Dad? That was the muse of an old man in his retirement. You can stream that live with better uh, audio for a dollar. I said, but it's my father. He said, well, you know. I said, I'm thinking about you. What am I going to, I mean, what, I mean, we all have to think about that. What is, things that are important to us may not be, be important to our children. And what our children think is important, again, may not be important to us. So I'm thinking, that we didn't remember the Indian Queen Tavern. Now maybe, maybe that's not important. For somebody like me, who is involved in the construction of the Constitution, what happened behind the scenes, the Indian Queen Tavern ought to have been a little monument in the corner, funded and kept as an example of the deliberative process outside. But we did not remember it. Okay, so let's move on. We can go to uh, uh, let's see. Just as a oh, well, let's go to Old Saint Joseph's Church. This is one of my favorites. Angela and I went through this. Uh, 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 really, was one very early on when we were yeah, yeah, doing a lot of this work. Old Saint Joseph's Church. All right. If you look at it, it uh, well, you're going to have to help me, Anthony. Let's, let's take a look at that one. Yes. All right, so Old St. Joseph Church was the only church in the British Empire which was Catholic, in which Catholics could openly worship. It was Jesuits. It was run by the wretched Jesuits. <laughs> and there you have the wretched Jesuit sign. But as a don't tell, don't don't ask, don't tell. The policy was it wouldn't be on the street. You'd have to walk through the hall, the alleyway to get to the church. And it's still active and it's still beautiful and it still, still has communion. But so how have we remembered it? We have remembered it in a way which has been preserved. And it has been preserved in the old fashioned way, but it has not been, how darn it, for example, that those darn Protestants and Quakers didn't permit Catholics to worship. In fact, if you look at history forwards, it was the first place in the British Empire that Catholics could actually worship openly. But so, there are two ways of looking at this. You could say they were pushed into the alley, don't ask, don't tell. Or you could say at least they were in the alley from which they could emerge, right? So it, it, it really does depend upon how you look upon the narrative. It does. So if we now, and it tells us 1732, 
I never thought until we went through Philadelphia that there was this large Catholic population in Philadelphia in the, in the 1700s. Where did they come from? Ireland. I always thought they came in the late 19th century. Here they are already. To, almost to the extent, now, Tony, if we go back to, uh, to, to your uh, scroller and we look at Old St. Mary's Church, which is right, right, if, here's so, Old St. Mary's, right? There's Old St. Joseph's there. Right across the street, within 40 years, they've built another Catholic church, which is right on the street. So everybody's forgotten the notion of you have to go down the alleyway to so now it's on the, in the open. And I think that's the story of America, that it is not a story of perfection at the beginning, but a story of laying the foundations from which other people in the next generation can build. And build they did. So at this church, which is right on the court and still in operation, George Washington went when he was there. George Mason went. He'd never been into a Catholic church before. And he wrote to his, he wrote, wrote to his son and said, I don't quite understand this. It's all this it's smells and bells and everything like this. And it was like what it was, Pinocchio shows. What do they call them? You, uh, yeah, incense. Right, yeah, right. All right. So, I mean, it's, it's and, you know, anyway. So, I think that's an important story. So, we haven't remembered the Indian Queen Tavern. We didn't know that there were two Catholic churches within walking distance of each other within the 18th century, and they're still preserved, and they're still very much alive. So there's a sense of religious toleration in there that we have remembered. Now, how that has been remembered, I don't know. Whether it's in the Catholic church itself has remembered it, or has received state support, I don't know. All right, let's return. And I'm gonna, I want to give you some time to ask me some, some, some questions of some kind. All right, now. Uh, you see, you can go all the way down. All right, so let's go uh, there. No, a little higher. Higher. Morris's townhouse. Robert Morris was an immigrant. One of seven. Think about it. There were... Uh, 39 signers of the Constitution. 74 got elected, 55 attended, 39 signed, and out of the 39, seven were immigrants. I don't know of any country in the history of the world, it may be there, but I don't know about it, in which they permit foreigners to sit down and write their Constitution. That's a foundation. Right? It's a, it's, a, it's, a founding. it's not a completion, it's a founding. And in fact, if you take a look at Article 2, in which the requirements for what it takes to become a president are stated, and it's, it's that you have to be a natural-born citizen. And then there's a comma. Except those who were citizens from foreign nations at the time of the founding. So they were grandfathered in. That's part of America, the grandfathering in clause, which is really part of America, right? It's not that they were prejudiced. This, was, this is part of negotiation. Anyway, so here's Robert Morris's townhouse. It was the most elegant place of all. And George Washington was going to stay with James Madison and the rest of them when he came to town. But Robert Morris, a foreigner, an immigrant, suggested that he stay at his townhouse. So George Washington said, well, with great reluctance, yes, I will. So what has happened to that? How have we remembered that place? So if we scroll down, and here, it, it was, um, well, if we look at this first, it was actually this should be below, and that should be above, but that's not your problem, Tony, it's mine. In the 1980s, I started tracking all of this. And Robert Morris's townhouse had become a woman's bathroom. <laughs> now it no longer exists because there's the visitor center across the street. 
See, you said, that's a shame. See, that's exactly the, 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 what I'm trying to evoke. That is, what do we remember? How do we remember it? Is it a shame? Is it not a shame? If it's a shame, what do we do about it? If it's not a shame, let's move on. Okay, so then, they decided, since it was a visitor center, they erased it. Okay, so now I'm tracking it through. Let's go down. Um, then they decide to think about, well, what they might put in place of the visitor center. I, I, I mean the women's bathroom. And they decide, and, and as they're going through, and here's the Liberty Bell, et cetera, they decide, well, it would be great if we were to put a president's house there because when George Washington became president and the government, the first time it was in, in New York, then it went to Philadelphia, back to Philadelphia, Robert Morris's house became the president's house. So that's where the presidency was located. So one way of remembering is to rebuild the president's house. But how has the president's house been rebuilt? rebuilt? The 21st century, it is this. And um, as, as we scroll down, it is um, it's reconstructed, not so far, not so, thank you. The reconstructed site opened officially in 2010 after a decade of extensive discussion among various civic organizations. It is known as the President's House, but there, what happens after the colon is important. Freedom and slavery in the making of a new nation. So that what the people who put it there wanted was to, in fact, push the issue of slavery into the face of Americans on a mall that was built for freedom, which is reminiscent of what is going to occur in Washington, D.C. within the next week or two, with the African American M Museum, which is put there as an in-your-face, on-the-mall difference. That is part, part of ar architecture. So if you go to Philadelphia, you will see part of Amer current America unfolding before your very eyes. So here's the Liberty Bell, here's the Independence Hall, and here now is, if you scroll down, um, well, that, well, well and, and, and is, is the, and it's open, it's transparent. Why? Because they want to tell you that in the midst of this freedom, in the midst of the independence, in the midst of the Constitution, there is this question of slavery. And I think that if you walk along Philadelphia in that corner, you have got right there a picture of what is going on in contemporary America. The idea of freedom, contradiction, slavery, aren't we beyond it? Did, did the founders put slavery in the, in, the, in, in the course of ultimate extinction, or were they really slave owners? And so do we even have, this is in Northern California right now, should we even remove George Washington's name from a high school? Okay, so that's what we're engaged in. And so this, so how have we remembered George, how have we remembered Robert Morris's house? How have we remembered the president's house? The answer is we have remembered it by presenting slavery as the key issue which needs to be considered. Okay, so that's part of what I'm talking about. So now, all right, across the street is the visitor center and right in there is, actually, which we can't see, is Thomas Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence, which condemns slavery. So you could just stand on that corner, and you could say, here's the condemnation, here is the rubbing. There is the Liberty Bell, here is Independence Hall, what is going on? And the answer is a complete conversation to the extreme about what America is and what, and, 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 and what is historical and worth saving and, and bashing about what it means to be American. So let's go back and cross the street now that we're all giddy again with happiness. Uh, we just cross the street. No, 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 I'm, I'm, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Mrs. House's boarding house. Now Mrs. House had a boarding house. And when Virginians went there, went to, went to Philadelphia, they would stay in her house. That was known as, that's where, you, that's where James Madison, that's where James Madison 
wrote all his notes for, on, on Philadelphia Convention. That's where the Virginia plan was hatched. That's where they talked. This is Mrs. House's boarding house. When I started tracking it in the 1980s, it was a man's bathroom. On the side, there, just next, there you go, Anthony, if you click that on. On the side, I don't know if we can get it even closer. Yeah, maybe one more time. We can't, but if we go to another one, that plaque says, James Madison lived here. And that was what we remembered of James Madison in that house. It was subsequently replaced by saying the first Supreme Court of Pennsylvania stayed here, which, and you can see, oh, James Madison, there you go, thank you, thank you very much. James Madison, isn't he good? James Madison, delegate to the Con Canadian Congress, father of the Constitution, as if that's not enough, member of Congress from Virginia, could even say President of the United States, boarded here in a house, right? A, a plaque. That's how we remembered it. Okay. Well, we can't remember everything. We can't keep clutter. We have to move on. So how do we move on from Mrs. House's boarding house? What would I like? I would have liked that house to be preserved as something to remember what James Madison was about and deliberative democracy. All right, so what have we got now? It has been demolished. And we have, a, we have a, a, a real nice East Berlin concrete stem in which any fool uh, can stand up and say whatever they want about anything. So democracy has, in effect, instead of being a balance between deliberative democracy, Congress, and the rights of conscience, individuals, so that you have this balance between the community and the individual, what has happened is that notion of deliberative democracy has gone or been replaced by stand up there and shout. And this is, this is, this is what democracy means. It means dissent. Okay, well, that's fine, particularly since James Madison wrote it except that's not acknowledged, and it's not acknowledged that the two go together. Never mind, let's see what else they've done with this spot. So let's, if we scroll down further to the end, right to the end, this is what it is now, it's a public transport station. And you would not know, unless it was some madman like me, with Angela's help, had followed over the last years and, and recorded, this is what James Madison lived, this is what such and such, and no one would know the difference. But there are some things we must throw away. There are some things we must keep. There are some things that get transformed, and that is the story of who we are as, a per, as an individual and in our relationships. And I realize, for me, it's a tragedy. But for others, it's progress. Why do we want to keep Mrs. House's boarding house? Why do we want to keep Mr. Morris's townhouse? We must move on. Doesn't the world belong to the living? The world does belong to the living, but what is the living owe to the old? And what is the living owe to the unborn? And what is it that we pass on? And we cannot, I mean, constitutionalism requires that there be some kind of enduring quality that, that, that takes place. So, to conclude, because I want you to ask me some questions. Um, I, I mean, I could go through all of this. Obviously, you know I could. And there's a story behind every dot. And I want to remind you that this is one of multiple subsets that are available to you as students and teachers to go and explore on your own. But let me just say two of the favorites that have occurred to me over the years. Um, on this particular spot, right there, is where Gouverneur Morris lost his leg. Now, Gouverneur Morris was not an immigrant but he was a son of an immigrant. Gouverneur comes from his mother's name, who was French. We adopted his mother's names. It's not governor, it's Gouverneur. 
So it's Gouverneur Mars. And there you see him with his peg leg. And he lost his leg in an accident along that street and Dock Street. And I have offered the city of Philadelphia a couple hundred bucks to pull a little, put a little plaque on the spot that he lost his leg. I have not received a response. But if you were to click this on a bit more, uh, no, no, not, not, not Fitzsimmons House. Uh, yeah, scroll down then. I guess we're there. Um, it's on this spot right here that he lost his leg. But what's so important about that? Well, it shows a certain that we haven't remembered, but I think it's worth remembering because it shows a certain side to the framers that is not necessarily depicted, but it doesn't show them in a bad light. It shows them in a human light. And that is, he was in a carriage with a married woman. And an irate husband followed the carriage. And Mr. Morris jumped out of the carriage, but the wheels of the carriage ran over his leg. And on the medical advice, it was cut it off. And there's been a number, if you want to go back there, we can see some saucy little stories uh, for, and exchanges from people who realized that he had his leg cut off and it suggested that something else should have been removed. <laughs> um, John Jay, what, 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 if you go up, you've got it. John Jay uh, apparently wrote to Morris that he was tempted to wish or uh, had lost something else. <laughs> so there's this exchange between them, right? I mean, I love them, but at the same time, they're human. That doesn't mean to say because they're human, they're not worthy. They are worthy. Okay. So he lost his leg there. What happened? Well, um, Jefferson returned from uh, uh, France. He was the ambassador to France. He returned after he saw, after Jefferson. See, Jefferson's all, all in favor of, of you know, having blood and it gets, you know, it gets, gets the soil all manured and everything. And then, of course, he, then he saw the blood of people's heads being chopped off in the French Revolution. He didn't like it. So he wanted to come home. So he came home and Washington said, well, I've got to have somebody in France. Who can stand blood? Gouverneur Morris. <laughs> so Gouverneur Morris was nominated and appointed to become ambassador to France, still with a peg leg. He was in a carriage with Talleyrand's mistress. <laughs> and people thought this great carriage that you know, the le people, the, 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 the uh, various low-level people in France that thought that this was part of the aristocracy. So they went up and shook the carriage. And, 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 and Robert, and, and Gouverneur Morris apparently took his leg, peg leg off and waved it through the window and said, I lost it in the revolution. <laughs> and he was given a, a, a great uh, escort out of town. There are lots of stories we can talk about. See, I'm seeing people smile. If you smile and you like it, then you might enjoy it. You cannot love something that is ugly. At least I can't love something that's ugly. And to me, America is being presented too often as something that is ugly. And now to the point that we cannot even present that which is an alternative without being apologetic. Maybe. It takes an immigrant to do that. I have been here for 50 years. And of course, I could put on the West Indian accent as I want to. But I've been here for 50 years. And I have number one website in a world. Right. right. OK. All right, so let's end it with the City Tavern. The City Tavern. This is what the city tavern looked like in 1787. And it contained it such and such. This is 1787. Let's look upon it as what, what it looked like today. That's great. That's great. Well done. This is what it looks like today. So they've saved it. They have preserved it. 
It is still available. You can go in there and get colonial food. You can get revolution, right? And the atmosphere is there. So there's part that has been preserved. There's part that has not been preserved. There's part that has been deliberately eliminated. There's been part that has been deliberately kept. City Tavern is an example of what has been kept and preserved. So I, so, but something happened at the city, the city tavern that I discovered, and I put up on the website, but after only 15 years of deliberating whether or not I should do it. I found this in, 19, in 1980s when I was a volunteer for the Miracle at Philadelphia uh, Bicentennial. And I, was con uh, and I discovered this in a box. And we need to go to George Washington's farewell dinner, Anthony, which is under resources of the convention in this section, entertainment of George Washington. He's so good, isn't he? Very good. Anyway, so we stopped there. So I discovered 55, 55, um, where the hell is it? There's 55 gentlemen. So I know there are 55 delegates. Uh, it says 14th of September, 18, 1787. I mean, that sounds very close to uh, 17th of September. So I think maybe I've discovered the farewell dinner for the framers. Subsequently, I found out that it's not. It's the regiment that Washington was with that gave him this farewell dinner. But I found out later on that the dinner menu does not change at the city tavern over the weekend. So Monday was the 17th. This was the Friday. So this menu is going to be the menu for the, for the framers who went and signed the Constitution and said, let's celebrate. To relishes and olives, 20 pound 12. 54 bottles of Madeira, I wonder who got left out. 60 bottles of claret, I wonder who got five more. Eight bottles of old stock, 22 bottles of porter, eight bottles of cider, 12 bottles of, of beer, seven large bowels of punch. The, the, spelling, the spelling of the framers is not of the highest. They had the internet. Cigars, that too. Spermacity, candles, etc. To decanters and wine glasses and tumblers broken. Now, see, this really demonstrates the extent to which America is a democratic and commercial republic. The 16 servants and musicians got paid. They also got 16 bottles of claret. Five bottles of Madeira and seven bulls of punch. <laughs> no, but it's like bowels and bulls, what's going on? Doesn't anybody know bowls anymore? And in fact, if you look at it, doesn't anybody eat anymore? What's all this drinking about? Some people ask me, so what? So when they're could the framers recognize today? Say, I would say, yeah, but the one generation they could not recognize was the Prohibition era. That's just an absolute, I mean, it's the water in Philadelphia in the 1780s. So now, let's say, so now part two, a bill for the musicians. Also, the musicians are going to get paid. Don't they just do it for their own good, for example? Well, so George Krishliff gets a pound. Mr. Schultz gets a pound. Mr. Trenner gets a pound. John Kaiser, William Hartung, Philip Rotti, David Kotschak, John Runa, Conrad Spackenberg. What are all those Germans doing there? <laughs> I got in touch with uh, Mr. George Chrysliff, the 75th or whatever, and he told me, oh, they're all folks who fought for the British as mercenaries under King George, as Hanover Hanoverians, and they came over and they were captured. And they were captured, and I guess they liked American food so much in prison that when the, when, the, when the treaty came in 1783 and the exchange of prisoners of war, they decided to stay in America. So here they are, four years after the treaty, playing at George Washington's farewell. I think that's an incredible immigration story and an incredible American story. Thank you. So Tony, run the show. What what do you want? How do you want it? You got a Who has a question?
You have Hi. notes. I was just wondering, yes. what do you think is important right now that we should teach our children so future generations don't forget? That there's something called the Constitution, that it was put there with an idea for, um, for, for us to, 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 to ponder. It is not a document that is like Moses and the Old Testament, but it is a document which guides us and that we should remember that self-government is always an issue and that civic education is at the core. Therefore, if you think the Constitution is going to answer everything, it will not because we have to learn about it. I mean, how many people go behind this document? According to the Parade Magazine, last weekend, 28% of Americans admit that they've read the Constitution. Well. That means that 72% have admitted that they have not. That seems to me to be an answer to your question. At least let's start with reading the Constitution. I doubt that the 28% who have read the Constitution would have gone through something like what I did with you tonight. Because what I'm interested in is not how necessarily the Constitution has been interpreted, but how the Constitution got to be what it was. So I would say that that would be the important Ex lesson and exercise to teach the young. That it is an important document, it's a central document, and that they ought to spend some time reading the convention notes. Never before in the history of the world have people been elected, sat down, deliberated, divided, they'd been disgusted, did everything, and yet at the end made an agreement and no one was killed. I think that is what needs to be remembered, not somehow a war on this or a war on that or a war on that. Can we talk, as the old late Jane Joe Rivers used to say, can we talk? Let's talk. I think that would be the lesson. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So throughout this lecture, you talked a lot, or at least I thought you talked a lot, about the concept of American identity. Who's an American? Are they immigrants? Are they women? All of these things. And the Constitution was written a while ago. It was written more than 200 years ago. And I know you said that, say, transgender people, there's all of these things that limit the worldview of people who wrote the Constitution. And the, my question is, now that we're in a new generation, we're the generation that has to pass it on. How, how are we going to deal with that? We have new issues. How are we going to use the Constitution to how are we going to apply the Constitution to these new issues? Okay, my smart aleck reaction is that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> but what I mean by that in a less smart aleck way is self-government goes on every generation. So the framers were founders. They did not lay the final document. So it is up to us to be educated and sensible enough to negotiate our way through. For me, the most important phrase that comes out of the Federalist Papers is the deliberate sense of the community. Federalist 63, the deliberate sense of the community, which means that ultimately the Constitution belongs to us, not to the court, to us and to the deliberate sense. So my sense to this generation is if you've got an issue, then you have to go out and persuade. Don't throw rocks, persuade. If you can't persuade, then maybe the next generation will persuade. That's the price you pay for democracy or de democratic republicanism. You may not get your way this time, but this next, by the way, let me give you another example. I, well, and I've said, dark and early in the morning, I'm off to Albany to uh, Skidmore College to give a talk. I know when I get to Albany, I am highly unlikely to get a cab that's driven by a natural-born American. Now, what, what, what am I getting at? When I go to Washington, it's an immigrant that's doing the work. Why? Because they come here for a better life. Americans aren't willing to drive a cab. Immigrants are willing to drive a cab. And why do they drive a cab? For their children. So their children wouldn't want, want to drive a cab. If you want to see the American dream, Look at immigrant taxi drivers. So um, just, just a follow-up question. Are we in a democracy right now? Because it's, it's one of those things where democracy, true democracy, 
to me, can only exist in a very small community. When well, everyone that weighs true democracy to you exists only? In, in a small community. True. So democracy to me is when everyone weighs in equally on a thing. And right now, we're a republic. Well, you know, I don't want to get into this. I, I do not want to get into an, a discussion about we're a republic, not a democracy, because that reminds me of the John Birch Society of the 1950s and 1960s. What I would ask is we're a democratic republic. And a democratic republic means we the people are important, but we the people elect representatives who do the job, rather than we the people answering directly through we like, we don't like. So I would say um, to, to complicate, one answer to your question is I hope that we're still a democratic republic. I am dis disillusioned that the republican aspects are being uh, undermined, particularly the respect for Congress and the idea that somehow we elect a president and the president is elected to do whatever he wants or she wants. And that's, it seems to me, is not, that, that's not republicanism or democracy. Uh, to complicate your, your, your question, it is, is, is to introduce the notion of the administrative state. That we have, in fact, produced, ne we have neither, in a sense, pure democracy nor pure republicanism, but the idea that somehow we've elected uh, enlightened administrators who are supposed to do all the jobs for us because you and I are too stupid to run the show. And I think that is the problem that we face, that enlightened administrators are taking over our lives where we can't make the decisions. So I would, I would actually twist your question from are we a demo democracy or a republic to saying are we a democratic republic or an administrative state? Our question. You have Thank another you. question? <laughs> no, I'm good. Were you going to dominate all this kind of be like, I just, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> you have a lot of thoughts? That's good. I admire you for your, all your thoughts. Well done. Thank you. I appreciate you coming out tonight. Very, very interesting. Curious, what other constitutions have you looked at that compared to ours that have been created in the last 200 years? And Americans had a lot to do with the post-war Japanese constitution. And what things did MacArthur put in play in that that came from this and maybe did a little spitballing on his own. Well, there has been, you are quite right. Within the last 40, 50 years, a lot of constitutions have been written, and including, but not limited to the Japanese. And one of the interest, there are two interesting points that, that, that come to mind that distinguish these new plans from the original American constitution. One is the length of these, constitution, these constitutions. I mean, you can't put it, put it in your top pocket or your back pocket or, or wherever, you know, however. I mean, it, it, the size that you're going to be distributing, right, you can put it in your pocket, right? You can't put these constitutions in your pocket, right? It's, you've got to put it in, your, in, the, in the trunk of your car. So first of all, so that discourages ordinary citizens from understanding it and puts more and more power in the high, hands of, quote, enlightened administrators to interpret. So that's one thing that I've noticed over the last 40, 50 years. The second thing I've noticed is what the constitutions are supposed to be doing. I mean, what is a constitution supposed to do? And I think the American constitution is saying what we're supposed to do is to lay out, A, what the purposes are, six, Liberty, justice, domestic tranquility, common defense, union, general welfare. How are we going to do that? Separation of powers, Article 1, Congress, Article 2, President, Article 3, uh, uh, the judiciary, Article 4, what one state owes to another, Article 5, how we amend it, Article 6, who's boss? Then come the amendments. These other constitutions give, are not like that. They're not readable. And somehow, they think that they are more advanced than we are because they're guaranteeing. The word guarantee is very interesting. The word guarantee does not appear in the US Constitution other than one place where it says 
Republican, Republican government shall be guaranteed to each state. The word guarantee has in, been introduced in constitutionalism since, the world, since World War II. The Constitution is supposed to guarantee. I think the American founders thought a Constitution was to be an outline, a framework, not a guarantee. And certainly not a guarantee for health care, for education, and for the forgotten man. That was something that we were to work out ourselves. That was not supposed to be the role of government or a constitution. So that is what has changed. And a number of intellectuals have bought into that, that there are a number of constitutions across the world, not limited to the Japanese, that are superior to the US Constitution. In fact, Justice Ginsburg has said that, that the US Constitution is inferior to a number of other constitutions. And one has to add, wonder why. And the answer is because it doesn't, quote, guarantee things that others, other constitutions do. I was just wondering, in light of this new election coming up in the Supreme Court, do you think that everybody on the Supreme Court should uh, be a constitutionalist? In should other be words, what? should be a constitutionalist. Should everybody on this Supreme Court now be a constitutionalist? Well, my personal opinion is yes, but I'm more realistic to know that that's not going to happen. And because there are at least two competing views of what constitutionalist means. One is a more literal reading of the words of the text, that there's something called separation of powers, and particularly there's a limited role for the judiciary in the Constitution, and there's a limited role for the presidency in the Constitution. And so for me, when you ask me about constitutionalists, I would like to see judges who understand that the judges have a limited role and that the presidency has a limited role. I do not see that likely to take place because I think judges no longer are judges they're interested in justice, not judging. They're interested, they're part of the administrative state. I think that is the real central problem because the administrative state does not recognize separation of powers, Congress, president. It, it is interested in the administrative state and the administrative state is actually centered in the presidency. My, I, I was on a, a, a panel a couple of weeks ago in, in, in Philadelphia where we were talking about the, the whole issue of trying to reintroduce limited government. And my point, and I was very critical at the time of certain conservative thinkers, I said that there are a couple of conservative thinkers who have actually, during the George Bush administration, have empowered the president way beyond before, and Obama now is simply inheriting that. And that what we need is both liberals and conservatives to become constitutionalists, not just judges, but liberals and conservatives to see that there's an important role for Congress to play in the Constitution and not just not say that the, that the presidential election is all there is in town or the only game in town. And that maybe, just maybe, I have no idea, but maybe with the election of Clinton or the election of Trump, liberals and conservatives in Congress may come together and say, we have to restore the war powers of Congress because we not, have no idea what Clinton is going to do and we have no idea what Trump is going to do. What? Well, look, 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 look at it, right? Look at that. You're not going to have it back. I have one, but I'll give it to you. I see it's not for me. You see that? I knew it. Even though I could fit it in my pocket, it's not for me. No, no, no. I know it by heart. I know it by heart. You want, what, what article do you want to know? Oh, the Proverbs? Oh, no, no, no. That comes in the anti federalist Federalist literature. Sir. All right, no, well, well, could we stop that one, Tony, and go back to the, 
Now that is an extremely important question in terms of interpretation. If you look at um, the Christie painting, right, let's stop it there. You will notice the windows, the mere windows. See, what I've done today is I haven't talked really much about the Constitution as text, except in terms of question. All I've done is talk about a painting and running through Philadelphia, et cetera, right? But here, these windows and are open. Why? Because there's a signing. The curtains are closed during the deliberations. The one person who was deeply concerned about the closing of the curtains to stop the noise and peeping toms was Thomas Jefferson, who thought that democracy required transparency, that it was a mistake to close the curtains, that the delegates should not have met in secret. They should have been open. James Madison's response to it, there's a time for talking and there's a time for meeting the press. And the time for talking was 88 days while we hammer it out. And then what happens? We meet the press. The greatest pamphlet war the world has ever seen. Federalist, anti-federalist, up and down the states. Reporters were there. Newspapers were full of it. So Madison's response is, yes, we, we need some kind of, shall we say, it must be a, a, a nicer word than secrecy, privacy. Secrecy has this anti-democratic ring, all the better to shaft you, my dear, tone to it. But Madison would say, I'm going to give you an example in today. I, I, yeah, see, transparency, transparency, transparency. But what happens with transparency is we're all in front of the cameras. So we will say all that kind of stuff, which means we all look at each other and say, well, when is we going to get to business? The answer is politics likes darkness. And unless you have darkness and the shadows, you won't get things done. You open the curtains when things are done, and then you can, get, and then you can talk about it. And it's, it's, another way of looking at it is I've been, I've been teaching for a long time. Uh, and, and one of my least favorite times of the year was when, bless them, deans would think that what we need to do to start off the new year is to have all the faculty together, get them out of their houses, leave their cell phones behind, leave everything behind, and join us on some mosquito-infested <laughs> retreat in which you can't have cell phones, you can't have telephones, right? you can't have television, you can't have any modern commercial decency. <laughs> You're lucky if you have flush toilets. You have to go out, right? All right, I won't get, I won't, I won't, right. But the point is, so I, what, what are they trying to do? They're trying to create camaraderie. And then we get into these silly games. I'll tell you what. I'll get into a blindfold. And what I will do is I'll fall back. And I will trust that Rosemary will catch me. And that's what builds trust. Why don't you close the blasted windows instead? So I think that this whole notion of how do you build trust. See, their problem was how do you build community without building Group think. That is an extremely difficult task to do. And one piece of evidence for me is that they, is that they managed it, is that three people descended at the end. And the three of them, darn them, showed up for the farewell dinner. So how, right, and people left, and they came, and they left. So I think the real task here is, how do you produce community without collectivism? And that has always been a problem. I know deans are well-meaning, meaning let's take them away from their families. Let's try to create. This. But it, it ends up being silly, totally daft. 
They could save the taxpayer money. They could save student fees. And, and, and instead, what you could just tell, tell the dean is, why don't you go by yourself? Milton Friedman, a great economist with whom I studied at the University of Chicago in economics before I decided to do something sensible like this. We were talking about this. So who, give me, the, give me an example of a free person. And his answer is, a tenured professor at a private university about to retire. <laughs> and my answer to Friedman now is, a tenured professor at a university who has an endowed chair and paid off his mortgage. <laughs> I am free. <laughs> <laughs> But it doesn't come overnight. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Lloyd, for your very entertaining, engaging, thoughtful lecture tonight. Please join me in thanking Dr. Lloyd. I. I have, to end, I have to end in a good Catholic way. The blessings of liberty be upon you. And so therefore, let me put it in Latin. Bona libertas. Bona libertas. We have a couple of things. One, uh, oh my we wanted to present you with a gift for speaking here tonight. As you know, President Reagan was a cowboy who loved the Constitution. Dr. Lloyd is a bit of an intellectual cowboy. So we thought uh, this might be a fitting gift to say thank oh, you for tonight. Oh, let's see if it fits. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we've also put underneath uh, four of your seats, there is a, there, there's a green paper. So we have copy, four copies of his book to give away. So check under your seat if there's a green piece of paper. Oh, look at uh, them. <laughs> <laughs> then you have, it's like a golden ticket, Willy Wonka's uh, Chocolate Factory. So we have one here. And uh, there might be some empty seats in the back that might have one. So if you, uh, we got two, and, and I think. By the I way, two. I'll sign it, and I'll sign it with a Reagan pen. Oh, wow. There we go. That, so, I, uh, that was given to me two years ago. So please feel free. If you, if you have one, come on down. We have the books here. We'll have them sign it. Otherwise, I think there's still some food out there. If you're still hungry, thank you so much for coming tonight. <laughs>